Welcome to This is Getting Old. I'm your host, Melissa B., PhD, and today I'm joined by Dr. Jackie Campbell, one of my favorite people in the world. And today we're going to be talking about her career in nursing and the impact that her work has had on the world. So welcome, Jackie. Thank <laughs> so maybe, you, maybe to be on with you. Well, good. So maybe um, for those of so for those people listening that haven't met you before, maybe give us a little background about how you got into nursing, and then we'll just kind of walk through all the different evolutions of your career. All right. Well, having been privileged to walk this earth for a pretty long time, I um, actually grew up in the fifties, and my father was convinced that. Um, I needed to go to college. He had not gone to college. Um, so he, he was in favor of women's education to that extent. Um, and also that my brother would go to college and that, however, I needed to prepare to learn how to either be a nurse or a teacher in college, because that way when my, if my husband, which he assumed I would have, um, happened to die that I would be able to get a job and that's exactly how he explained it to me okay. and so my mom was a teacher and I didn't want to be a teacher like her so I wanted to be something different and I thought nursing sounded kind of cool so I said okay I'll be a nurse and um, my high school counselor said well you don't need to go to college to be a nurse. You can just go to the local hospital school. You know, why do you want to go to college? And I said, because my father said I have to. <laughs> <laughs> and my grades are good. So, you know, why not? <laughs> you know, um, so that is entirely. And my father also, you know, controlled where I applied to college and um, he asked our family doctor in a small town where one should go to college to be a nurse. And um, the uh, physician, for whatever reasons, we lived in New York State. He said, well, University of Rochester is a good college. And then there's also University of Michigan. They have a nursing program. That'd be good. And then my father had been... Uh, during World War II had uh, done some officer training at Duke University. Mm -hmm. So he found out somehow that Duke had a college for nursing. And Duke back then was very cheap and we needed cheap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, New York, the University of Rochester was good because we were in-state and you could get in-state tuition, but to me, that sounded very close to home. That was only a, an hour or two away from home, and I didn't want to go there. And so um, the more I found out about Duke, it was far away, and it sounded lovely. And I got and to visit North Carolina. Campus. Yeah, I've got to visit the campus. It's very romantic. It's, you know, and so I decided, ah, Duke. Okay. <laughs> that's, and that's why I, I applied to all three of them, and I got on into all three of them. and. Um, but I picked Duke because of it being far away and beautiful campus. Yeah. And so we share yeah. that connection and actually a lot of your story about how you got into nursing kind of mirrors mine. Yes. Um, yeah. So when you were in nursing school, um, well, actually let's just go ahead to graduation. So once you graduated, what area did you begin to specialize in with your practice? Well, I, uh, again, was governed by the fact that I had gotten married while I was in college and my uh, now ex-husband wanted, uh, got a job at General Motors in Dayton, Ohio. And so um, we took off and uh, went to Dayton, Ohio. And I looked around and I said, you know, what are the hospitals here uh, to become a nurse? And there was three different hospitals. And so I interviewed at each one and I was offered a position at St. Elizabeth's um, Hospital. I wanted to work with kids. So I wanted to be in the pediatric unit. Um, and uh, I'll never forget, they offered me a job for $3 an hour. 
And I said, well, I have a baccalaureate degree and most of the nurses there were hospital diploma school graduates. And they said, oh, that's right. You get a differential. You get one cent more an hour. Wow. So I got three dollars at one cent an hour in my first job. And I did love it. It was on a pediatric floor. I, I chose that hospital um, in part because it was close to where my husband was working and we only had one car. Um, but um, I fast learned that even though I felt very much like a novice nurse, that um, because I had that baccalaureate degree, I was given a lot of responsibilities and I was offered a head nurse position after three months um, that I didn't want and I didn't feel like I had. And plus it was very unhandy to be working seven to three or three to 11 and we only had that one car. <laughs> and um, and the, it didn't match my husband's hours at all. So I um, saw, I, I believe it was in the newspaper, that there was an advertisement for a school nurse position at a high school that was very close to his job. And um, it was an inner city high school. Um, but it, and it offered more money um, and much better hours. And some are off and you know all kinds of good things <laughs> so, yeah. so i applied for that job and i i actually did love that job it was a wonderful job and it i probably would still be there happily um doing school nursing with adolescents in an inner city high school um to this day except um i got pregnant <laughs> and um at that time, you know, one was going to uh, not keep working when one was pregnant because the idea was, of course, that not that we had enough money to do that, but that I would concentrate on child rearing. And uh, so I left that job and um, worked part time as a childbirth educator that seemed to fit in with the responsibilities of a new baby. Um, and I also, though, in that job as a school nurse, my supervisor was very excited about me going on for a master's degree. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought, well, while I'm, you know, home more, uh, maybe this is the time to explore getting a master's degree. So I got a master's degree in community health nursing and rehab, even though I thought what I wanted a master's degree in was either in pediatric nursing or in mental health. Uh, but the, the uh, university that was close to home uh, did not offer that master's. So I instead, uh, since they offered a master's in community health, I said, okay, I could do that. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, Many of those decisions were very serendipitous, very not well thought out, um, but um, mentoring was important because um, this um, supervisor who said, you must get a master's degree, Jackie, um, you know, that was one of those early lessons that it, it really does help a lot in whatever you do to have people that mentor you and guide you and help you take your next steps and, and fulfill whatever potential you have. Uh, again, serendipitously that the program was at Wright State University. It was led, um, that uh, program was a very experimental, new kind of thinking around a master's degree. It combined um, an, a lot of courses on nursing education uh, with this very broad definition of community health. Uh, it was led by Gert Torres, who uh, was a, a, a feminist and a rebel and a big proponent of 
uh, nurses being strong and, and taking leadership roles. Um, and so um, one of my first courses had a strong bent on feminism and on uh, addressing uh, injustices in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of our coursework was around that, which was very unusual for the time. Uh, Peggy Chin, who is the editor of Advances in Nursing Science, uh, was one of my uh, uh, faculty, chief faculty, and one of my advisors. Um, and, and she is um, amazing in terms of groundbreaking work in feminist nursing scholarship. Uh, and so I was, again, very fortunate to be mentored by her. And uh, so we were in our community health clinical for this master's program. We were told to uh, go out into the community and work with an identified group and um, work on preventing their uh, most serious health problems. So um, I um, loved those adolescents and young women. Um, and I was trying, at that point, I had two little kids um, working part time and wanted to do this assignment in, as expeditiously as possible. So I called one of the young ladies that I had um, mentored from that high school and who had graduated then. And I said, you know, have I got a deal for you? Um, let's get together with some of the, your friends um, that I loved and miss. Um, and we'll have a little reunion. I'll bring cookies, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and um, we'll get together and um, mostly, you know, get together and reunite. Uh, but also, um, I have to talk to you about health problems while we're there, <laughs> whatever health problems you have. So uh, what was uh, also interesting about that was that, um, you know, our, we were taught, our faculty said, you know, go see what's um, the uh, killing people um, in whatever cohort you're trying to um, prevent their worst health problems. So whatever aggregate. And they, um, so I went to the mortality tables, the number one cause of death for young black women, they were all African-American, um, was homicide. And I was like, well, I'm a nurse. What do I know about homicide? I don't know anything about homicide. I can't prevent that. Let's see what number two is. And literally, um, Peggy Chin and my other advisor said to me, no, you don't get to do that. If that's their number one cause of death, you better find out about it. You better talk to them. And by the way, you have a master's thesis to do, and that would be a good topic for research. You know, who is murdering young black women? Mm -hmm. And so I, <laughs> And, you know, in my naivete, marched myself to the homicide police department and said, I have to do a master's thesis. And, you know, I need to learn, you know, I need to collect data on homicide of women. And uh, I think those detectives were intrigued to have a young woman come and want to hang out with them. <laughs> Um, and so they paved the way for me to do that. And homicide records are public records. So it's, you know, it's not like you have to get dead people's permission to look at their files. Um, and so I, I talked to those young women um, about the violence in their lives. And I was amazed uh, because I really hadn't, know much about it. There had been a few cases of child abuse in the high school. And there was one case I remember now, you know, remembered then that 
I'd worked with a young woman who was abused by her stepfather, who also abused her mother. But, you know, I didn't know much and uh, didn't know much more when I was doing that master's thesis. Uh, but um, I did carefully analyze that data, um, did it sort of as a qualitative study in terms of what were the themes in those homicide records. And that's where I found out when women are murdered, they're most often murdered by a husband, boyfriend, or ex-husband, or ex-boyfriend. Um, and there's been prior domestic violence in the majority of those cases. And you could tell that there was prior domestic violence because there was you know, many, many police calls to that home um, before there was this homicide that occurred. The other thing that, um, you know, one of the things that when you look at homicide records and the autopsies that go with them, you see photographs of the crime scene. And, you know, I can, um, the sample size uh, was uh, 27 uh, women who were murdered and 26 women who murdered someone. And I can tell you about every single one of those 40 some cases. I could conjure them up in my head. And one of them that, you know, is stuck on my brain forever is a young woman that was shot in the temple um, by her um, boyfriend that she lived with. Um, and she was handcuffed to the chair in back of her. And, um, you know, as if that wasn't bad enough, uh, her arm was in a cast. And um, when the, you look at the autopsy, she had a fractured ulna, and which is the small bone in your forearm, which almost is almost never fractured all by itself. When you fall and break your arm, you break either your radius or both bones. You know, that's classic defensive injury. It's holding your arm up. Uh, so um, I, I didn't have access to hospital records, but I, I knew, you know, it was a fairly fresh break from the um, autopsy uh, photographs. And um, so I knew that she had been in one of our local emergency departments having her arm casted mm -hmm. um, relatively recently before she was killed must have been within the last couple of weeks. And so, you know, I knew right away, I was like, wow, you know, clearly we did not do a good job in the healthcare system. Now, what year was this? What, what time frame? Um, this, um, the, the master's thesis, I, I did the research, the, the publication from that is called Misogyny and Homicide of Women. I was pissed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> and so um, it, that was published in 1981. Yeah, so during at a time when we weren't talking about domestic, we violence. were not talking, and we certainly weren't thinking about it in the healthcare system. You know, domestic violence. It was starting to be. It was part of the um, some of the the um, women's uh, movement, feminist kinds of of agitation um, in the late 1970s. People were talking about domestic violence from that standpoint then, uh, but it was not considered at all have anything to do with the healthcare system in general, uh, let alone nursing. Um, and so, um, you know, part of, in my anger and rage, <laughs> that I was able to do was work with other, a few other healthcare professionals and collaborate with, with the, the handful of people um, that were doing research on domestic violence. It was political work, policy work, but not research um, very much at that point. Um, okay. So you published this paper. It's kind of I like your master's thesis, which I give you kudos for that. 
you know, right yep. off the bat, that doesn't happen very often. So it start, now it started you off on this different trajectory. So Right. And I, I worked with, um, I volunteered in domestic violence shelters, but I also importantly um, connected with a number of other nursing researchers. Most of us were doing our dissertations who had, uh, were interested in this issue in domestic violence and health. Um, and uh, we, uh, Dan Sheridan, who's another um, nursing scholar, nursing leader in the field in forensic nursing particularly, um, actually wrote a letter in AJN that um, he wanted to connect with any other nurses who were doing work in domestic violence. And he started the first hospital program for domestic violence um, survivors in Chicago. And so we all, you know, we, <laughs> This was before there was email. Uh, so we called each other and wrote each other, et cetera. And there was only, you know, starting to get to be email, but but that's well, how we you didn't have email. Until I was out of college before we had yeah. email. I don't yeah. even think I had college in graduate school and I graduated in 2000. So, yeah. right. So, yeah. <laughs> Just so because I, you didn't have email in the mid 90s doesn't make you old. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't make me old. Just, you know, that's the way the world was. So, we, that's how we connected. Um, and we actually uh, joined, made a small, we called it the consortium on uh, violence and abuse uh, research. And, uh, a nursing consortium, of course. Um, and we also started a small organization back then um, in the 1980s um, called Nursing Network on Violence Against Women International. It still exists and it's still, um, we still do good stuff. Um, and actually we just got our conference for the summer canceled as many com conferences are. Um, but you know, it was, it really was an exciting early example of nurses getting together, collaborating on stuff, thinking about stuff together, um, you know, and breaking new ground, not as individuals, but as, you know, this uh, nursing power um, group. And, and we really did make a difference. And we did collaborate interdisciplinarity, you know, as Always is true, I think, in nursing. We did collaborate with physicians. Uh, we did collaborate with other disciplines on addressing this issue as such a big issue. But we felt like nurses needed to be on the forefront, um, that you know, nurses were the ones that would see patients. Uh, we did a lot of the groundbreaking research on abuse during pregnancy, how that affects unborn children as well as um, their mom's health. Uh, we did, you know, a lot of, and, and I say we, not as a royal we, it certainly wasn't me by myself. Um, you know, we, we collaborated a lot. We wrote stuff together. We, um, we worked on, you know, getting published and, and getting in, in policy arenas. Um, you know, one of the early memories is that, uh, the American Medical Association did a big conference on um, uh, domestic violence and health, um, and they did it with um, the American, uh, I think it's American Criminological Society, it was legal folks, criminologists, mm -hmm. and uh, we um, tried to break into the party, and they didn't think we belonged, we as nurses, and we we had PhDs, but you know, we, we, they wouldn't have, uh, accept our abstracts and they, they didn't want us there. Um, but so we, we learned to get pushy and to, you know, and to get nurses to the table. And, and that's one of the things that, um, I have always said, I, I play well in the sandbox with all other disciplines. But when push comes to shove, uh, I get oftentimes invited to policy tables around the issues of violence and health um, because I'm me. And they say, yeah, we're, 
we're inviting you uh, because you've done good work. And I'm like, yeah, but see, if you, there needs to be another nurse here. You know, the nursing voice, the nursing research voice is important. It has a different perspective. We have that truly holistic perspective. We think about not only how it's affecting uh, women's uh, physical health, but we think about physiology. We think about, you know, behavioral health. We think about mental health. We, you know, we don't divide people into segments um, when we think about how an issue affects them. And we also do think about the injustice and the, you know, the, um, it lags behind always uh, for uh, marginalized groups, uh, for, for uh, women of color, but also women who um, uh, identify at a different place along the LBGTQ um, spectrum. So, you know, I, I think that um, it's important uh, that, uh, that we as nurses make sure that our science is well represented um, and that we're clear that it is nursing science and um, not just team science. Correct, so, do, so getting that word out there both ways. So, you know, I think one of the other things, you know, that I know that you did is you got, you got to testify before Congress. So maybe you can tell me of, like how that came to be and... Um, you know, the, again, mentoring is incredibly important. Nancy Fugate Woods, many, many years ago, um, asked me to be part of a con uh, congressional panel um, in terms of women's health. And that um, she, um, I, don't, I don't know how she discovered my work, but she was impressed with the work around um, the health outcomes of violence against women. It was, it was probably, um, I, I did a, an article, I authored an article in The Lancet in 2002 that's you know, been cited more than the rest of my stuff put together probably, um, which was a compilation of my research and other people's research in terms of health outcomes. And so based on that, she asked me to, to be part of this, um, Congressional committee, and um, that was my first uh, experience in testifying. And um, I, uh, uh, it was as you as is usual. You hardly ever testify before the entire Congress. It's more before a committee, right, um, or subcommittee, <laughs> or sub subcommittee. But anyway, so that was some sort of a subcommittee about women's health. Um, and so I, I, you know, never forget it was the first time I've ever been in such a august uh, thing. And, you know, and the, one of the things when you testify in Congress that always makes you remember to stay on time is you have a mic that they turn on and it's on while you're talking. And then as soon as your time is up, I mean, the, then the light will blink, goes to yellow and it blinks. And then when your time is done, the mic's off. So that really shuts you up well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes you practice too. <laughs> it makes you practice. It makes sure you're on time. Um, kind of like yeah. a Robert Wood Johnson Nurse Faculty Scholar interview. <laughs> kind of like that. That's Get in there, get it done. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so that was my first, and then I also was involved in the initial Violence Against Women Act um, when that was before Congress. And I didn't, uh, I was actually, uh, as it turned out, I didn't get to testify, oh darn, but you know, I was part of a panel that was, and they ran out of time or they didn't care, I forget exactly why, but I didn't get to actually open my mouth on that one. Uh, but then the, the most recent testimony was on uh, guns and the need um, to make sure that men who are violent toward their partners do not have access to a gun. Uh, the particular issue was what we call the 
the boyfriend loophole, mm -hmm. uh, which is that um, if you're married to a man who has um, abused you and that's in the criminal justice report, um, then uh, you can uh, apply for a certain order of protection that um, makes sure that the gun is removed. Um, however, um, it, that's the, the federal law has this boyfriend loophole. So if you're not married to this person, you can't get the gun removed. Um, some, many states have made it so in their state that you can, even if you're not married to them, you can get the gun removed with an order of protection. However, um, there are many states that will never do anything on a state level to strengthen um, gun laws, to make uh, gun laws more um, stringent than they already are. So the idea was that this should be federal law. It should apply everywhere. And um, that was uh, part of the, um, the re, what, revision, re of the Violence Against Women Act, which has not been reauthorized. Um, it was passed in the House, and this was part of a subcommittee hearing, but um, it has not been even brought up in the Senate. Uh, and so, so this hearing, um, one of the things is because I was asked to testify and I excitedly agreed. And they don't make your name public um, until uh, a week before the actual hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and one of the things when I'm at Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing. I'm proudly so. Uh, but one of the things we're, if we're doing any kind of testimony, we're supposed to collaborate, supposed to t uh, talk with our um, congressional policy person at the university. So I did um, let them know proudly that I was being asked to testify. Um, and they said, well, you know, Dr. Campbell, this is on guns. And um, so uh, you, you can't say that you're appearing on behalf of the university. Um, you have to um, uh, do your testimony and it's fine that you're going to as a knowledgeable expert, but you have to do your testimony as a private citizen. Um, you can say you're a nurse, but yeah. You know, this Hopkins business, you leave it out of it. And I was appalled, first of all. I was like, really? <laughs> um, and they're like, yeah, we, you know, we don't want the university, you know. So, um, but um, I belong to the American Academy of Nursing. I'm part of their expert panel on violence. And so I, I was so, distressed about all of this, um, I talked to a friend of mine, um, Catherine Long, at the University of Virginia um, College of Nursing. And, I, you know, I was like, no. And she was like, well, let's try and get it through the American Academy of Nursing. We've already written on, uh, a, an article for Nursing Outlook that talks about the need for guns to be removed from known domestic violence offenders. So, you know, based on that, um, let's see if we can get it through. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the American Academy of Nursing. Within two days, they had gotten it through um, the board of directors to say- Which is you know, no small feat. <laughs> no small feat, no, no organization is, but, but they turned it around and in two days and they gave me so i testified on behalf of the american academy of nursing and you know i think in many ways it was probably more powerful that way because you know people trust nurses yeah and and i was like oh i i should have gone there to begin with you know forget 
<laughs> my university. I did get my email was, um, I had literally thousands of emails. As soon as my name was uh, announced, um, I had thousands of emails from uh, gun manufacturers and, um, and the, uh, the organization to which they belong, the NRA. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, a, a very concentrated, uh, you know, I was, I was called uh, the favorite phrase, they clearly had talking points that were sent out to use, was feminazi bitch. Um, in an email? Oh, yes. Hmm. Um, however, no overt threats, because if there's actual threats, you know, you can yeah. go after them. You can call, I can call you a name, but I can't you threaten can you. You can call me any kind of name you want, honey. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, you can't threaten me, and there was no threats. Um, and I, I had to shut my email down for like a month. And not look at it. You can't actually if you if they get bounce backs, they figure out some other way to do it. So you can't like close your account, but you just have to go away from it because otherwise it's just too, you know, makes you crazy. Yeah. Even if you just read one, you know, just even pausing and deleting, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, so it, that was interesting in terms of how organized um, some oppositions are. Um, but it was an amazing, yeah, it's an amazing, and there is a clip of it. I want you to know if you go, if uh, Samantha B picked it up, um, in one of her, uh, broadcasts, um, you, you can get it on YouTube. And if you do, if you Google Samantha B boyfriend loophole, um, there's a little clip of me testifying. So my, my granddaughters thought that was the coolest thing <laughs> that I've ever done. <laughs> to testify or to be on YouTube? To be on so, the B. Oh, okay. <laughs> so all of that. Yeah, all of yeah. that. So, I mean, I think, I think in reflecting on some of the things that you've said, I mean, some of your career has been a lot like mine, serendipity, timing, what was convenient, but yet, it's all culminated towards making this big impact through your practice, your research, and then moving into policy um, to really change the world and change the narrative around and to, and to highlight that domestic violence, you know, even though you might have started with African Americans as your group, I mean, it doesn't know any racial boundaries. It does yeah. not, but it, but it is related to many health inequities for marginalized women. Right. Um, and, and one of the things I always say, which is still true now for me, is um, I am passionate about my science, um, my nursing science. I, I cannot wait to see the answers to my research questions because I honestly believe that they may be helpful uh, to women and it's mostly women, but men too, but people who find themselves in uh, situations where there's violence. So, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, why I do my research. Um, I love to teach nursing students to, to give them the benefit of the importance of nursing science and the importance of, of, uh, how much violence can affect people's health. Yeah. The other thing I hear is, you know, in your narrative is the fact that things aren't always going to be easy, but if you believe in what you're doing, you can kind of push through a thousand emails calling you ugly names. And, you know, maybe, maybe they did that to everyone on the panel, but they might've done it to you to try to get you to back down, you know, and yeah. that, you're you may have to deal with some of that um but you just have to be passionate and convinced that what you're doing is going to help people so yes yeah and um and i think no matter what the arena in nursing uh you know as as um i get older i i think there's a elder abuse is a reality 
mm -hmm. um, that we um, don't have nearly enough nursing researchers, you know, addressing that. Yeah. In our well, on the other side of that is you have older gun owners, sorry, older gun owners who may be developing a cognitive impairment. And, you know, so there's going to be that whole issue that's going to be coming up too. And so, you know, um, absolutely. absolutely. And the, you know, the whole notion of red flag laws um, that, uh, you know, people think about in terms of, of, suicide and people think about maybe in terms of emergency room uh, physicians or psychiatrists but you know it's where we do have red flag laws i think that nurses need to know how to use them how to invoke them so what is a red flag law because i have not a, heard of a red yeah a red flag law is a law that some states have um i forget um, not enough, um, but where if um, someone notices that somebody is um, at very immediate risk to either kill themselves or kill someone else, that you can um, go before a judge and get um, a, an order to have that person's guns removed. Um, temporarily is, this, is that something you report like adult protective services that you... um, no it actually it goes through the police okay. um, and then it goes it, it, this goes before a judge and it depends on the state exactly how it works out mm -hmm. um, but you know there's um, uh, physicians in those states are being trained to know how to look for, you know, and it's risk of suicide as well as risk of homicide. Um, but, you know, it's also supposedly for family members, for um, neighbors um, also, but, but in terms of, you know, if you go, if you get um, a statement from a physician, the judge is more, much more likely to grant this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the things I'm like, nurses should be getting this training. Mm -hmm. So if they hear something like that, or if they're talking to a family member who's worried about their loved one becoming either suicidal or um, likely to hurt somebody else, that, that they also know how to invoke that in a, a state. So, you know, that's on my list of 400 things to do yeah. uh, in terms of, of in those states, making sure that nurses are um, in on how that can be done and that judges know to recognize a nurse's statement as being also valid. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being with me today and for telling your story. You are welcome. <laughs> Any Thank final you interested? No, yeah, I mean, I think it's great. I mean, it, part of, um, like I told you before we started, you know, part of what I also wanted to do with this podcast was, you know, 2020 is the year of the nurse you know, and midwife. So that, that midwife part tends to be left off. So we're going to try to capture that too. Yeah. Um, but just sure. to highlight the, the richness of, you know, becoming a nurse, it's a career path. It's not, it starts with bedside care. I think we all agree you need, to have some of that too, but then it also then gives you the chance to follow your passions and to improve health and well-being. And you know, we're not making yeah. a statement about about gun ownership, or you know, it's just in certain situations if it impacts people's health, we want people to be thoughtful about yeah. um, right. about who and you know who and, and who own a gun and whatever. Right. So and to use nursing research, even if you're not creating it, you know, there's some of us that are actually doing the nursing research, but, but every nurse um, has access to nursing research and sometimes they don't realize there's really good nursing research out there on a, a topic uh, that gives them and also more. to know too, if they're, I mean, even if you're a bedside nurse or you're working in an ER and you're trying to figure something out and you go to the literature, look who's writing the article, reach out to them, email them, say, Hey, I'm, you know, I'd, 
this is a problem I'm seeing. You seem this is what your work is focused on. How can we partner together? Because the, you know, the nurses doing the science need the people, you know, uh, on the front lines, you know, letting us know kind of what they're seeing, you know, and then there's a way to partner in that way too. So uh, absolutely the best nursing research questions come from people who are actually practicing um, and, and seeing the problems. Yeah. So I just, I would encourage people you know, to do that. So, yeah. all right. Well, thank you again. And You're welcome, Melissa. It's always good to see your face. Good to see yours as well. Thank you for joining me today for This Is Getting Old. If you'd like to know more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or a related topic you'd like to hear from me about, just let me know. Thanks.